Hey Elonites, welcome to the Tesla space where we share the latest news, rumors, and insights into all things Tesla, SpaceX, and Elon Musk. We talk a lot about how Elon Musk is an industry disruptor. He likes to take the old way of doing things and flip it on its head. We've obviously seen him change the automotive game forever with Tesla, and we've seen him revitalize spaceflight as well, bringing crude rocket launches back to America with SpaceX. Of course, being the richest person in the world, or second richest depending on the day, it's a neck and neck race with Lex Luthor right now, Elon is not easily satisfied. And the next target on his path to changing the world is the telecommunications industry, more specifically, internet providers. Elon has been laying the foundation for his takeover of the global internet market for years, and that plan is finally coming together in the form of Starlink. The Starlink system is a network of small communications satellites that are deployed in a low Earth orbit around the globe. Each satellite is powered with solar energy and is able to navigate through orbit autonomously using ion thrusters. There are tons of them already, about 1,000, and soon to be tens of thousands in the coming years. Each satellite weighs just 570 pounds and is delivered into orbit by SpaceX Falcon 9 rockets. Every rocket launch is able to deploy about 60 of the Starlink satellites, and they're currently orbiting quite low over the Earth, just 340 miles up. That's the middle constellation. It will be joined by constellations that orbit slightly higher and slightly lower, and the number of satellites will grow to 12,000 in the first phase, and there is the possibility to eventually expand further to 42,000 satellites. This will allow Starlink to provide high-speed broadband internet access to the entire globe, no matter how remote the location, as long as you have a simple receiving device and electricity, you are going to be able to connect. The first ever public beta testing for Starlink began just a couple of months ago, and even in the very early stages, the system has been performing as good or better than expected. This is a technology that is on track to change the world in this decade. The reason for Starlink's existence basically comes down to two very simple reasons. Number one, there is a great inequality when it comes to internet access across the globe. Even in North America, Starlink is the fix for all of that. For those of us who live in major cities or even smaller cities, there are multiple options for cheap, fast internet. It's very easy to get. but for people living in remote or rural settings, there are often few or zero choices of service providers and no possibility for high-speed access. No 4G or 5G service either. We take this for granted, but there are thousands in our own countries, millions around the world, who don't even have the option to connect with the modern world. Starlink is the solution to this problem because it requires no ground-based infrastructure, with the exception of electricity, but even that can be provided by the sun. The relatively low altitude and high density of Starlink satellites will allow for super fast, low latency internet with up and down speeds that go way beyond what any other satellite internet provider is even capable of, and will rival any other conventional ground-based provider. This is leveling the playing field in a way that only SpaceX and Elon Musk could possibly do. This level of density for the satellites is only feasible because Elon happens to own his own rocket company, which also happens to make the cheapest rockets on the market, which also happen to be one of the few companies with reusable rockets. Rival companies have announced plans for similar business models, but not one of them has actually gotten it off the ground. Pun intended. Reason number two for Starlink to exist is, of course, money. Flying to Mars is really damn expensive, and if that's the master plan for SpaceX, landing on and then colonizing Mars like Elon has imagined, 
then they are going to need an epic amount of money to accomplish that. NASA contracts and private deliveries into space are great sources of revenue for now, but to get their ass to Mars, SpaceX needs a machine that prints money, and Starlink is that machine. The startup cost is obviously going to be very high. The company estimated $10 billion to complete over a 10-year period, which they began in 2018. But if by the end of that 10 years, they're able to build a client base of a few hundred million users worldwide, and each of those users is spending hundreds of dollars on their startup kit, then continuing to pay 50 bucks or so every month for their service, you start to see the potential here is spectacular. As of right now, in mid-January 2021, Starlink is available for beta testing in the northern United States and southern Canada, and that's the area best covered by the existing constellation of satellites. This is a very limited release right now. We're still in extremely early days, and Starlink is keeping expectations low by calling this their better than nothing beta. This is not meant to be a direct replacement for an existing broadband service yet, but if you're in a situation where you're only able to pull in like 20 megabits per second download, then Starlink will at least be better than that. And here's what we know so far about the beta. The cost for your initial starter kit is 500 US dollars. That gets you a mini satellite dish, a router, power supply, cables, and a tripod stand for the dish. Then you pay Starlink another $100 per month for the service with zero data caps. They're advertising the connection speed at anywhere between 50 to 150 megabits per second and with 20 to 40 milliseconds of latency. From the examples that we've seen so far on YouTube, the real world speeds seem to be closer to the 150 mark or even higher with some pretty impressive upload speeds to match. People in the mountains of the Pacific Northwest who don't have access to fiber or 4G in their locations are getting solid results through Starlink already. The only issue so far seems to be short interruptions in service, just 15 seconds or so of lost connection at a time. It already seems like a great deal even in these early days. The biggest con that beta testers might face is the need for a very large and clear field of view for the satellite dish. The receiver needs a 100 degree field of view of the northern sky that is completely unobstructed. Even so much as a tree getting in between the satellite and the dish will cause an interruption in service. So even if you live in the middle of nowhere, if your house is closely surrounded by trees, then unfortunately this might not work for you. Not yet, at least. The field of view constraints will decrease as more satellites are added to the network. Remember, we're only at 1,000 satellites out of an eventual goal of 12,000 and more. One of the really cool things about Starlink so far is that the system does not seem to be negatively affected by cloudy skies or bad weather. The receiver unit can actually detect snowfall and will automatically run hotter to melt the snow as it falls on the dish. Given that most of the beta testers are in the middle of winter right now, that seems to be working out great. But what about the downsides? Yes, this is the part of the video where we do have to acknowledge that this is not a perfect system, and there are at least a couple of problems that Starlink is dealing with right now. The biggest challenge comes down to the light pollution caused by the initial design of the satellites. Astronomers find them to be so bright that Starlink is interfering with their observations of outer space. The large number of satellites orbiting so close to Earth cause a ton of interference for these high-powered radio telescopes. It's made worse because the satellites are autonomously moving around in space. They don't follow a set pattern that observers can work around. And it's not just astronomers. There have already been a few casual stargazers who have been convinced that they've seen a cluster of alien spaceships streaking overhead. Until they later find out that it was just our resident alien, Elon Musk. But he's working on it. Elon took the criticism to heart and has worked out a new method to mitigate the brightness of each satellite. From around September 2020 onward, 
all Starlink units are equipped with an anti-reflective sunshade that does make them less visible. It's still not problem solved, but it is an improvement and a step in the right direction. And Elon has committed to working with astronomers and coordinating the movements of the satellites to work around their observations. So we'll have to see how all this works out. The other potential issue caused here is space junk. If you've all seen the movie Gravity, then you know that space debris can be some straight up catastrophic shit. Yes, I know that was just make believe, but the disaster scenario that is depicted in the movie is not entirely science fiction. There is already a lot of junk floating around up there, and Starlink is planning to send up thousands of more satellites, each one with the potential for failure. Any failed Starlink units are expected to come back down and burn up in the atmosphere within five years. But that's a long time frame for a potential disaster to happen. The worst case scenario is something called the Kessler syndrome. Imagine even if two completely useless chunks of space debris happen to smash into each other. They would break apart and create more pieces of space debris, which would then float around smashing to even more debris and cause more breakup and more pieces and this continues exponentially until the entire Earth orbit is just a big clusterfuck of space junk all smashing into each other. And that would be really bad. Obviously, there are measures in place to avoid this as much as possible, and that's why every satellite is equipped with these ion thrusters. Ideally, they are supposed to propel themselves downward into the atmosphere before they reach failure. There are also systems to avoid collisions between different groups of satellites, but it's not a perfect science. There was one near miss a couple years ago when a Starlink satellite did not move to avoid a German satellite, and they both came within a dangerous threshold for collision. At the most, there was only ever a 1 in 1000 chance of impact, but that is still a 10 times higher probability than should ever be allowed to happen according to regulations. So that's Starlink, the good, the bad, and the potentially ugly. It's here, it's working, and it's absolutely on track to change the world someday. But that day is not quite here yet. As the network grows through 2021, the opportunities for beta testing should be expanding as well. What do you guys think? Are you ready to drop the cash to try out Starlink for yourself? We'd be curious to hear from anyone who has already gotten the chance as well. If you want to continue to learn about everything regarding Tesla, SpaceX, and Elon Musk, we've got two more video options for you on the screen to check out. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up today if you liked it, and subscribe to our channel for weekly content just like this.